Okay, everybody, take two. I didn't have the audio on right the last time I tried this lecture. And I just want to keep it brief because, uh, you know, the, the articles and the videos speak for themselves. But I want to sh highlight a few themes and some, some issues that arise and are uh, illustrated by these assignments. Take these initial slides for what you think they may be worth, but they're, they're artists' attempts to try to illustrate some... Um, visual reference to underlying uh, mental disorder. So schizophrenia, which affects about two and a half million Americans, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, the biggest one of all, of all the psychiatric diagnoses. Autism is an interesting one because there are people who make somewhat convincing argument that it's not really a psychiatric disorder. It's a different way of processing information and integrating um, life's experiences, and if, and if you're on the quote-unquote quote high-end, high-functioning end of autism, what used to be called Asperger's, um, you, you can live fairly independent life and uh, just be different. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, people with the, with the low, what we call low-functioning autism, it's, uh, independence is very, very difficult, and uh, and they, they need a lot of care. Bipolar disorder, uh, you swing back and forth between periods of mania where you have extraordinary confidence and euphoria and then crash with almost suicidal level depression, bipolar from one pole to the next, paranoia, anorexia nervosa, social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, sleep disorder, body dysphoric disorder. This article, um, God Knows Where I Am, about um, Linda Bishop's case in New Hampshire, it, it, it exemplifies and illustrates why severe mental impairment is one of the hardest, most intractable areas of healthcare for patients who don't want these labels and diagnostic uh, diagnoses that they don't wanna be diagnosed with schizophrenia. And they have periods where they're lucid, and coherent and can, they can function just fine. And then when they slip into remission or when they slip in back into the condition, as you saw in this article, um, they, they can't act in their own self-interest. And that's the most pernicious part about severe psychiatric um, conditions is that the patients themselves can't act in their own self-interest. Not a spoiler alert, but she ends up dying of um, starvation, and she catalogs it all in her diary, so she knows that this is going on. And um, it's just there's a documentary version of this. That's a that's just a, I signed the article because it's just just easier to get through. But as you saw in the in this article, this tension between patients having autonomy to choose what treatment they want when they have it seems so important to us. And we don't want to violate that. And other times you saw Linda Bishop's family saying she really needed to stay in the hospital. Involuntary commitment was the most appropriate path because if you let her go and don't notify the family, she's liable to, to get hurt, which she did. It's this huge tension of patient autonomy and what is best for the patient is the hardest in severe psychiatric disorders harder than any other area. And that's it. I mean, she, you know, she, she took some medications, some mood stabilizers. Sometimes it would work a little bit. Other times, you know, a lot of people who take those drugs really don't like the side effects of them. And they just hate that when they take a medication, it makes them feel like they are that diagnosis. Um, and so they oftentimes would rather, in a sense, suffer from the disorder than suffer from what the treatment makes them feel like. Even if it gives them some greater clarity and less impairment, their mood, their, they feel worse about it. And then, you know, once you're an adult, you can choose what you, what you want to do, even if it's not in your best interest. And e. Fuller Torrey is the, one of the leading experts on schizophrenia in the United States. And he has uh, spoken at length over the years of, there are times when patients cannot advocate for their best interests. It's an exercise in futility, and they need the state, they need a family, they need an advanced directive to take better care of them. Ellen Sachs is a, a 
professor of law, psychology, and psychiatry at the University of Southern California. She also has schizophrenia, and she has written that her forced treatment when she was at Yale as a student was one of the worst experiences in her life. And what she argues instead for is, is that she puts, as she mentions here, advanced directives, which says, you know, in a sense, if I, if I have a relapse, if I go back into these conditions, here is exactly how I would like to be treated so you can maintain some of their, their dignity and autonomy. Really, really challenging issues. And you, there she is, Linda Bishop. And, and then it's, it's a tragedy. I mean, so, sometimes you read these and you, you, you know, my temptation as a professor is to say, here's the policy, here's the protocol, here is whatever is appropriate in these situations. And, but guess what? I mean, each situation has its own unique characteristics. Every patient is, is different. They have some, some similarities with other people who have this similar condition, but they're never 100% uh, the same that you can come up with policies for large numbers of people. Which brings us to Madison Holleran. Um, you know, and it's just another example of the tragedy of undertreated or untreated, under or undertreated um, serious psychiatric disorders. And one of the takeaway phrases I hope you all can share with uh, your friends and family members is, is that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to show people you're not okay. And that's not from her, of course, that's from her family who wish they could, they could have intervened earlier or done something. But so as is so often the case, um, families don't know, loved ones don't know, patients themselves don't even have a sufficient level of self-awareness to act and again in their own best interest. Um, and I included this, this ESPN clip, this is the book that's based on her because I just think it's, I think it's a situation a lot of college students can find themselves in, uh, especially early on, just overwhelmed. And then with all the social media feeds of her friends, you know, making her feel like her life wasn't matching up, it can really be a, an unhealthy situation for young adults. Now, different kind of case. I included this New Yorker article because this can be almost uh, something to be concerned about on the other side, which is you, you overdiagnose and overuse medications to the point where the patient doesn't even remember who they are. Like the, the, who is the base person before they get all these diagnoses that have drug treatments that for each drug treatment, there's a side effect. You have to get another medication to address that side effect. You have that cascade effect where you're, you, 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 you wake up one day and you're taking five, six, seven medications. And the, the, the first ones for your condition, so to speak, and then all the ones after that are to deal with each one's side effects. And you know, it's just, sometimes you need to, you'd almost need to taper off and push back on some of these diagnoses that are just sort of, in a sense, they don't really address what is ever the underlying condition. And, uh, that's one of the problems with psychiatric diagnoses is that they become labels. So you are schizophrenic or you are autistic, right? Or you're bipolar and it's like, it's not you anymore. You are this label and people rightfully resist that. You are a person separate from whatever condition you may or may not have. Um, and then another example of how to, you know, to, how to come to terms with a diagnosis and then still forge your own path of autonomy, right? And uh, this is just, you know, I love this for all the obvious reasons. And, you know, and just appreciate that not everybody in society can, can conform or even wants to conform to whatever quote unquote is normal. <laughs> normal is still a huge range and there's, you know, this is, the terms normal and abnormal, if you ever think about this, it's, it's really freighted and loaded terminology um, because you could just say different, right? Abnormal, normal is, has all this underlying like what should be or what is, what is not in accordance with what should be. And an underlying theme of all of these assignments is that there's, there is a tension and there is a pressure in our society to conform to 
what is normal and what is understandable to other people. And for some people, that's really hard. That's just, it's not who they are. It's not their background. It's not their wiring. And the old criticism of psychiatry was that uh, prior to like the 1980s, the old model, the Freudian dominated model, the, the, the psychiatry back then and still can be to this day is a way of making people conform to what is normal or to a tighter range of what's acceptable because that's just a that's a that's part of our species is we don't want people to be too different right so uh and finally just susan davis talk is sort of the way to kind of bring us out of all of this at the end when she really emphasizes the importance of uh feelings and emotions and not to categorize them as positive or negative. There we go again, it's like normal, abnormal. Um, for her, like feelings are just in a wide array of data deliverers. They deliver data to you and they're evolutionarily evolved to inform us about, that they can be signals and uh, indicators of Things that we need to all of a sudden say, oh, wait a minute, I, this, uh, this emotion, this feeling is indicating to me something I should, I should focus on or give some attention to. And if we medicate those away or if we say those are bad feelings and we suppress them, then as she says, you, you end up very emotionally rigid. And that's dangerous because if anything comes along and your relentless positivity uh, it just can't handle it, you just crumble. And so you know, this this... This, her talk also speaks to this enormous societal pressure to be positive, focus on the positive, um, be, be someone who's positive so that people want to be around you and emanate out a vibe of positivity and don't talk about being down or discouraged or fearful or anxious or depressed because those are bad feelings. And so as you grow as a child, adolescent, teenager, young adult, you're, you're, you're encouraged in so many ways to suppress, ignore, um, negate negative, quote unquote, negative feelings and focus on the positive. But as she points out, that is, that is a bad message. You, you want a, an unhealthy message is to take emotions and feelings and label some good, exalt those, and others bad, and they're condemned and stigmatized and shamed. Because as human beings, we need to be familiar with the entire array spectrum of emotions. They're incredibly valuable tools for resilience, for, uh, for, for uh, agility, for being able to, to navigate the ups and downs of life. All right. Thank you guys. We'll, I'll talk to you again soon. You have stopped screen sharing.